afternoon, Pell Harvey family. Today is Wednesday, January the 6th, and we are finally back for Wednesday afternoon Bible study. Take your Bible and turn with me uh, again, picking back up in the life of Elisha. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. You know, it's my first time teaching in 2021, first time opening the scriptures. I can't wait to see what God has for us this year, so let's get to it. When I was a kid, I have this vague memory, and I say vague because I can't remember the whole day. I can't remember all of the all the, the the subtleties of the day. I just have kind of the high points. It, I was really really young, but I remember one day my parents took uh, me and my sister, maybe some friends, and we went to an amusement park together. And we'd spent the whole day and we'd enjoyed ourselves. But I remember toward the end of the day, my parents took us to the last ride we were going to do. The last ride, we come up to the gate. And we look back and it looks a little different than all the other rides. It was, there were trees and park benches and bushes and it was out in the woods. And it was a ride to where you stood there and an old car pulled up, like a Model T. And you got into the car and you just took a leisurely stroll through the woods, kind of as the last ride of the day. I remember this as being odd. Because I'm waiting for another roller coaster, didn't know what to expect, and now we're, we're just taking a Sunday stroll, you know. And so I'm waiting at the gate, and when the gate opens, my parents and me, we, we walk through, and my dad said something to me that he had never said before as we were walking to our vehicle. He said, hey, Dusty, why don't you get in the front, why don't you drive, and we'll sit in the back. And this had never happened before. I didn't know how to drive a car. I didn't know how to do that. I may have sat on his knees and, and you know steered a little bit, but I didn't know how to drive a car. But I just kind of always had this mentality. If you don't know what to do, just you know fake it till you make it kind of situation. All right, that's my motto for life, you know? So I, I get in the front seat, act like I know what I'm doing. I get behind there, we latch all the doors, the man comes, tells us everything's good. And then all of a sudden I hit the gas and here's what happened, the car leaves. And so the first few minutes, I'm, I've got my hands just kind of on the steering wheel, and I'm doing this because I don't know what else to do. And I'm driving along, and here's what I'm finding, that there are trees everywhere, there are bushes everywhere, but I'm not hitting a single one of them. And so I'm dodging trees, and I'm dodging bushes, and I'm staying on the same path that the cars ahead of me are on. And I'm starting to feel like this, this driving thing is not that difficult. As a matter of fact, uh, from, the, from the back seat, my parents even remarked at one point, I remember Dad saying, he, he said something like, Son, you're driving the fire out of this thing. And for the first time, I'm driving and I'm going, you know what? I am driving the fire out of this thing. And so we get going and we, we get all the way back to where we are and I get out of the car and I feel like I've accomplished something, like I've proven my manhood to everybody who has watched me drive this vehicle. And so I get out, maybe I even did the sniff test. Like, you know, in the sniff test is when you've done something really well and somebody makes a comment about it and you just kind of are, 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 you know, humbly getting through it. They're like, Dusty, you, you were amazing driving that car. And I was like, well, I mean, I mean, you know, it was just, it's just something I do. It was one of those moments. Here's what I didn't know. I didn't know that underneath the surface of that car, Built into the path, there was a mechanism that was responsible for grabbing that car and pulling it along the path. That mechanism is what gave that car its power. That mechanism is that thing which guided that car along its correct path. That mechanism was the thing that even gave that car its measured speed. What I didn't know during the process is it did not matter how often I twisted that steering wheel, that car was going to do what it was designed to do. Now, here's where I find great comfort in my theology about God. I believe that God's will is sovereign. That means that God runs the world. Now, I believe that there's a part of God's will, His permissive will, which God allows us to make decisions, and, he, and we make choices, and those choices have consequences or blessings, but we get to make those, those choices. And so much of the wisdom of God through the Scripture is meant to work itself into our hearts so that we'll make the right choices and stay on the right path. But there's another side to God's will, which is God's sovereign will. That sovereign will says that there are some things in life that God is going to make sure that they turn out the way that, that, that He wants them to. For instance, I will today decide what it is that I want to do with my day, what I want to eat in my meals, what I want to put on when I get dressed in the morning, but 
the strategy that God has from Genesis to Revelation, he is going to make sure it turns out the way he wants it to. So there's a level of permissiveness, and then there's a, a, there's a, a, a measure of his sovereign will. And I'm going to tell you where I like it and where I don't like it. I don't like God's will when I want to go this way, but he wants me to go that way. I don't like his God. I don't like his will then. Now, I know his will is always right and always better, but I'm hard-headed. Other times, I love the will of God, the sovereign will of God, especially because I feel like that some days, no matter what I do, I can't do anything right. So I have this, I find great comfort in knowing that somewhere beneath the surface of life, God is moving and powerful and active and he's going to take care of his people. Now, I take great comfort in knowing that God knows what he's doing. Especially when I read stories in the Bible that reflect moments where they're just terrible moments. I like the power and the, 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 the majesty of God's will when I'm in my own situations in life, or I see others in situations in life where they're struggling, where they've hit life's up and downs, obstacles, or, or bumps and bruises, or twists and turns along the way. I like knowing God is in control. I like knowing these things. Because they give me hope that underneath the surface, even if I do not know what's going on and I cannot explain what's going on, I've got no answers for why bad things happen in people's lives. I do know that underneath the surface, God is always good and he is always right and he is always merciful and he is always gracious. And so underneath the surface, I find great comfort in that. And you're going to need to know that too when you read through the story we're going to read through today and you go through life's troubles. That even if you don't know it's there, there is this undercurrent underneath the surface that God is good, you can trust Him, and He's going to take everything and He's going to work it together. Now here's the passage. I'm going to need you to understand that to really get. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 beginning in verse 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of uh, dove droppings for five shekels of silver. And then, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him and said, Help, O my lord, the king. And he said, If the lord does not help you, where can I find help from you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son that we may eat him today, and, when we, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she had hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of this woman that he tore his clothes and he passed by on the wall. The people looked and underneath he had sackcloth on his body. And then he said, God do so more to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. But Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him and the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And when he was still talking with him, there was with the messenger coming down to him. Then the king said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if God would open the windows of heaven, how could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now, I can only think of a few other stories in the Bible that begin as bleakly as this one does. As a matter of fact, this story is so, uh, is so big, it's split really into two scenes. There's the before and then there's the after. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the before because it, 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 would, it would not do justice to either the before or the after to try to take them all at one time. We just don't have that time. So we're going to look at the before. 
Only a few stories in the Bible will resemble this one. Stories of starvation or war or pestilence or, uh, or, or, or armies coming against cities. But here we've got an extra dynamic that we're not really used to seeing in the Bible. A situation as bleak as parents are cannibalizing their own children. Now, admittedly, you and I know this. This is not the type of story that Sunday morning when we come to church that our preschool department is going to meet together and study and talk about and tie with a nice ribbon and say, haven't we learned a lot about God and, and to make a craft about. I mean, this story is bleak. As a matter of fact, uh, the preschoolers will never read this in their Sunday school department, for better or for worse. And most adults I know are even going to avoid this. Why? Because of how it makes us feel. We love stories about God being our refuge and our safety and our, and our ever-present help in times of trouble. But this brings a question we don't often like to consider is, what happens when we need God, but we don't feel like He's near? You think about it. Think about, think about how this story makes you feel. Do you feel disturbed? Do you feel distressed? Do you feel shocked and uneasy? And if the answer is yes, then I'll tell you, you're on track because that's how it's supposed to make you feel. As a matter of fact, if we were to take this story and we were to, we were to share it with somebody that you've been sharing Jesus with, and you've told them how God loves them and He sent His only Son to die for them and how gracious God is and how loving God is and how God is love. Would they read this and also now have some questions? Would they be uneasy, unsettled? Would they struggle with this? And probably for 99.9% .9 of them, they would say yes. And so if we can admit that saved people and lost people all read this story and we go, this story is not right then we have to conclude that, that all of us know in our own hearts we were built for something better than what this world offers. Matter of fact, you remember what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world entirely. Remember, there's a track running below this. I don't want you to lose hope here because God is still there. He is still powerful. He is still moving. He is still good. You need to keep that in the back of your mind as you process through this story because, because God is good even when situations are bleak. Now, the lessons of this story are pretty simple. Their illustrations obviously extreme, but this, the lessons are simple. The first one is sometimes the hardest thing you can do in life is just wait, especially when you are waiting for things to get better. The second thing is life is ugly, and it's going to be that way, and it's going to get that way, and it's especially going to be that way when you push ahead by just your own willpower. You're pushing ahead maybe into things that you know you shouldn't have, but you've done it anyway. Life gets messy. The other thing is about politics. I mean, realistically, we're reading a book called Kings, and we're finding what man has been able to bring for himself. There's a politician there. There's a king there. And he, he's got nothing. He's got no help. Why? Because there's a really only one king. And only one king in all the world who can really do something. This guy, admittedly, he says, I, I got nothing for you. I can't do anything. And so he's not a real king. He's a pretend king. And in this world, if you put your hope in men or politics or kingdoms or kings or leaders, you will eventually be disappointed every time. That's why we don't, that's why we don't ever think we're going to see some utopia when, when some candidate gets in office. And we also don't have to despair one another. Why? Because this world is going to continue, but God is the constant. Now, here's what's happening in this passage. The border raids from previous stories had stopped. This enemy king, his name is King Ben-Hadad II of Syria. He'd evidently decided that raiding Israel wasn't good enough, and he's now ready for just full-on war. Now, rulers, the reason is rulers often had to prove themselves and their courage and their value to their people in order to justify their leadership. And so they would raid other countries here and there, and they would have little skirmishes and dust-ups. But eventually, especially if politics got tough at home, the, the thing that would galvanize their nation was war. King Ben-Hadad II of Syria had had a series of defeats in skirmishes because Elisha had been hearing from God what his battle plans were. He's passing these things on. And so Ben-Hadad, he's racking up list after list after list of failed attempts. 
And so now he's got to galvanize his people. And probably what's happening here is he says, hey, we're just going to go full out war. And everybody kind of gets behind him. And this is how he goes. So this time, though, it looks like he's caught the king of Israel on his heels a little bit. And, uh, and he wasn't prepared. Now, they, admittedly, this Israelite king probably wasn't too sharp when it came to military matters anyway. He's only survived because God's been giving him the battle plan of the enemy. But at this point, the siege of Samaria, which is the capital of Israel at this point, they've been sieged for so long by the enemy that they were starving. Now, what's interesting is verse 33. Look at it. It says, And while he was still talking with them, there came a messenger coming down to him, and the king said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, that last sentence is pretty, is pretty telling. Because what it's insinuating is there was probably a previously unaired, undocumented conversation between the king and Elisha. And Elisha's recommendation to the king was, in light of all of this battle, Elisha's recommendation, was just wait. And time and time again, probably the king said, no, let me get my army, let me get, uh, let me hire some folks from some other nations, let's get everything together, let's get a battle plan. And Elisha had every step along the way, Elisha had just said, wait, wait, wait. Remember, one of the hardest things you can do is ever wait. The people had gotten exhausted. They are reduced to eating unclean food, such as a donkey's head and dove droppings. And uh, for these things, they paid an exorbitant amount of money. As a matter of fact, it's talking about in this passage how much it cost to buy a donkey's head. It says there was, a, there was a great famine in the land. Verse 25, there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove dropping for five shekels of silver. Well, one author put it like this, The famine was so great that the people of Israel even ate donkeys, which were unclean animals. Furthermore, they ate the flesh of human beings. At $2.50 per shekel, one donkey's head would have cost them the equivalent of about $200. $200. As a matter of fact, they're, now when they're buying the manure of a dove, which you've got to be pretty desperate, a cab was a dry measure of about two quarts, so a fourth of, the cab, of a cab was about a pint, and that sold for five shekels of silver. So they're buying manure for $12.50. Can I tell you what? And that's only what the rich can afford. When you start reading through this passage, what you're finding is this was a, this was a very bleak time, and they had resorted to even the unthinkable. This is the cannibalizing. Cannibalizing? They're eating their own children. I mean, this is, this is a bleak moment. Now, if we're not careful, we can fall in the same kinds of thinking as these people where we read this and say, well, you know, where is God? This is not fair. I thought God was good. Why would God let this happen to his people? Why would all of these things happen? But let, let, me, give you, let me give you a thought here. When you are tempted to doubt God's goodness because you can't see his goodness, maybe it's below the surface of your current situation. I invite you to take a step back and ask, is God wrong? Or has something prior to this led us into this wrong? Now, I think you can rewind the tape a little bit in the story and you can find what God has already said. In the book of Leviticus, what if God has already predicted moments like this in the Bible? And so now they're getting here, now they're surprised, now they're wondering, where's God? And he said, I told you this stuff was going to happen. The book of Leviticus chapter 26 says this, and if by these things you are not reformed by, by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you. I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of this covenant. And when you are gathered together in your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Here's what God told his people from the very beginning. The way they live their lives and their own wrestling or non-wrestling with sin would often have a direct relationship to the level in which God was going to protect them. That if they walked in his ways and according to his statutes and follow his commandments, he was going to bless his people. But if they decided to do their own thing, he would allow some things to pull them back. Why? Because there's nothing, there's no better teacher in life than hardship and sometimes discipline. 
Let me give you another passage. Deuteronomy chapter 28 says this, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, and they shall, they shall besiege you at your gates until, until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout your land. And they shall besiege you at the gates throughout all your land which the Lord has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your own body, which is the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord has given you in the siege and in desperate straits in which even in which your enemies shall distress you. Now these verses are written hundreds of years before in the days of Moses. They had these warnings for almost 500 years. And now they're surprised that it's happening. Here's the other side of the story. Their situation implies that they either did not know God's word or they didn't care. I'm going to tell you, this problem has also still not gone away from us. Because when we sin, we sin because either we don't know that God has said don't do something or we don't care. See, we're separated by a lot of years, but we're not so different than all of these people. Sam Stevens said it like this. He said, the more I counsel, the more I'm convinced that the most common plague that plagues the life of believers is biblical illiteracy. They don't know the Bible. Most can articulate their love language or their Enneagram personality type, but they're ignorant of God's expectations for their own personal holiness. Now, let me, let me bring this into modern times. What's going on in your life where you know God has said do not do something and you're doing it anyway? Or God has said yes, do this, and you're not doing it. Now here's the deal. What makes you any different than these folks? Let me give you another promise that I think comes later in the Bible, but based on God's character, it was surely written uh, as, as, as important for them as, as any other age. 1 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will hear their land. See, if, if, if all of that's true, and it is, then at any point this Israelite king could have called his people to humility, to repentance, and this situation could have been avoid, avoided entirely. But can I tell you the downfall of a lot of men? Pride and stubbornness of men will be the downfall of men. Don't forget it. Look at verse number 30. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Now I don't want you to miss this. Anytime somebody in the scripture wears sackcloth, they're wearing a very harsh, a very irritating, a very coarse material against their body. The scratching and the discomfort that would come from wearing such a garment is supposed to be symbolic of the inner turmoil that they're feeling about a particular situation. This was sadness and this is suffering and often these these rags were symbolically married to the fact that I am I'm of such inner struggle I am ready to repent. I'm ready for things to get right. And God, please uh, see my calls. But with the king here, he, he's, he's kind of in an ironic situation because he's wearing these clothes of repentance, but he's covering them with his royal robes. So what's happening, his inner life is in turmoil, but his outer life is clothed with professionalism as if, yeah, everything's fine. You know, uh, he was basically what's happening here is this king is hurting and he didn't want to show it. J.I. Packard would say, he, he said, I am a sinner who is gifted or cursed with the ability to talk better than he lives, and I don't want folks to forget that. See, there's a New Testament concept, I think, here that's a mirror image of this. What's a mirror image? It's a reflection of what you are, but it's the opposite side of it. And so what the, the, the mirror reflection here is, Jesus tells us in the New Testament to not hide our lights under a bushel, but instead to put it on a lampstand. Why? So that it may give light to the whole house. So you don't take something good and cover it up. The opposite side of this mirror reflection is what's happening here, where this king is in something bad, and he's trying to cover it up. 
And I wonder if that level of, de of deception is just as displeasing to God. Now, can I, can I tell you something about hard times? The, the, the hard times here, yes, they're extreme, but let me tell you something about them. Hard times are as certain in our life and as common as death and taxes, but they do, it doesn't mean that all hard times are also bad. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Tim Keller says it often takes an experience of crippling weakness for us to finally discover God's blessing. That's why so many of the most God-blessed people in the world, they limp as they also dance for joy. I think about people in the Bible like uh, Jacob who wrestled with God. He went on in the blessing of God, but forever in his life, he always walked with a limp after that day. But Parsons said like this, he said, there are no wasted tears in the Christian life. I want you to remember something. That's part one of this story. It does get better. I want you to remember that until then, life is very much like riding an old Model T at an amusement park. There are moments where there are ups and downs and twists and turns and bumps along the way, but underneath the surface of life, especially the Christian life, there is power that is moving and is good. God is good. God is gracious. He has a plan. He has God has everything well in hand. And you can trust Him. As a matter of fact, I, I, just, I just thought we would, we would conclude with just this one thought. That no matter what situation you find yourself today, look up, brothers. Your salvation draws near because God is with you. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you for our time in the Scripture. I pray that you'd help us that when we look at life, although it may seem dire and troublesome, worrisome and distressing, we trust you. We know that you are good, that you are great, and we may not know why this path has come to us, but we do know that you're still in control. Father, help us to learn, even through life's distressing times, that you are good. We can trust you in everything and that you're, you're trustworthy. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you soon, church family.